Welcome to the Psychopharmacology Institute podcast, offering unbiased pharmacotherapy education for mental health clinicians. Hello, my name is Flavio Guzman. I'm a psychiatrist and professor of pharmacology at the University of Mendoza in Argentina. I also serve as the editor of the Psychopharmacology Institute. In this program, I'll interview Dr. Derek Tracy on bupropion. Dr. Tracy is a consultant psychiatrist and the Associate Clinical Director for Crisis, Inpatient and Rehabilitation Services at Oxley's NHS Foundation Trust, London. He's a BRC Research Fellow and the Neuromodulation Lead at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College, London. Dr. Tracy also sits on the editorial board of the British Journal of Psychiatry. His team published a review paper in Therapeutic Advances in Psychopharmacology titled Bupropion, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Effectiveness as an Antidepressant. This was a good opportunity to review an old drug and update its clinical profile. In this conversation, we try to define situations in which a bupropion may be a good option and situations in which it may be better to avoid it. Bupropion is an antidepressant of the aminoketone class. It's a weak norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor. It doesn't inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. The drug is FDA approved for the treatment of major depressive disorder, seasonal affective disorder, and a smoking cessation drug. However, in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, it is not licensed for depression, so it is used off-label for this indication. Since Dr. Tracy is from the UK, he and his team wanted to know if using bupropion is an evidence-based treatment even if it isn't approved for depression. We discuss the following topics. The effectiveness of bupropion as monotherapy and combination therapy, and how it compares to other antidepressants. The limitations of the literature reviewed. The importance of considering the possibility of insomnia and agitation when prescribing this drug. Symptom domains for which it may be more effective and symptoms for which it may be less effective. The use of bupropion to avoid and treat antidepressant-induced sexual dysfunction. And finally, specific clinical situations in which this drug can be a good therapeutic option. So the first question is, how effective bupropion is as monotherapy and how does it compare to other antidepressants? The data are good, and I think the, the evidence supports the effectiveness of bupropion. There, there were several types. The, the studies for monotherapy were placebo or they were head-to-head, -head. and in both instances, the, the data support the drug. So we had, I think it was about 20-plus um, trials that were placebo-based, and they show superiority. The head-to-head tend to show equivalence so that that would say that whatever drug bupropion was compared to and we had data for ssris snris tricyclics and trazodone there was about equivalence with it there's no clear superiority of bupropion but it wasn't clearly inferior either so i think overall the data show that it works there are challenges to that uh, which is often the case with the pharmacological literature so if we take the head-to-head -head papers there are, if you take any individual comparator drug, there are typically quite few studies. So you could take uh, fluoxetine or citalopram, and you will find head to head. They sometimes lack a placebo arm, and on occasion there are only one or two studies in them. So I think there is a problem about the number of studies. So the, I would say there's equivalence to other antidepressants uh, uh, as monotherapy, but there are, are the inevitable difficulties with the literature. Can you elaborate more on these uh, difficulties? We have the classic problem of what I think are population size effects. So you get 
if you compare drug A and drug B, you tend to show they're about equally effective. But what we know happens with any given antidepressant, and indeed any given drug, we will have subpopulations of partial responders, full responders, and non-responders. And most of these trials are underpowered to delineate it. So one of the challenges for all of us in psychopharmacology of antidepressants, we know drug A might be equivalent to drug B, but we will have people who respond to one and not the other. And one of the big challenges for us is trying to delineate who are those people within that. There's another problem, I think, with bupropion literature in that a lot of the trials are in treatment refractory populations. So people who have trialed and either failed or had limited response to one or more antidepressants, typically two, three or four. In one sense, that's not surprising because bupropion isn't typically a first line drug. But on the other hand, when we interpret the pharmacological literature, we're all aware that the more drugs one fails on, the less likely a pharmacological response is to work. So I, I would say that the evidence base is good for bupropion in terms of how it faces up with other antidepressants in monotherapy, but one has to be cautious about interpreting this. And it, it's always, it, it's a, the classic difficulty of, of thinking, will this drug work for the patient who's in front of me? What about uh, using bupropion in combination? Does the evidence also suggest it is an effective uh, augmenting drug? I think it applies for both. So, but the, the, as as you mentioned, there is work looking at bupropion as monotherapy and as uh, an augmenting drug. In both instances, it tends to be in treatment refractory populations. The the, the drug combination studies are quite interesting. So, this is a, an interesting area in general for us in psychopharmacology, and it's it, to me personally, I'm I'm always curious that we are very keen to aim for monotherapy in mental health and in psychiatry, whereas lots of other professions are quite happy to have polytherapeutic drug reg regimes. If one thinks, for example, of treatment of cardiovascular disease, it's common to have different agents that work in different ways, but it, it tends not to be how we think in mental health. But following on from that, what's unique about bupropion is its pharmacodynamics. So it's working on the noradrenergic and dopaminergic systems. It's working in a different way. And th this is appealing for several reasons to people. So I, I think one of the ideas is we can prescribe this with existing antidepressants, classically with SSRIs, and there is the hope that it will augment it. Now, of course, augmentation can mean several things. Augmentation can mean one drug improves the performance of another one, or in a synergistic way, or it can mean they work in parallel. And at the moment, we're not entirely sure when bupropion works as an augmenta augmenting drug, what exactly it's doing. But the, the data, again, are interesting and positive in terms of combination. So the data would support adding in bupropion to another antidepressant and getting an additional effect. Now, that varies from person to person. It's not always a straightforward additive effect. It's certainly not clearly synergistic. There is not strong evidence that bupropion enhances the first antidepressant, but we're not entirely sure what's happening. And I think one of the other attractions for bupropion in terms of combination is that it has a reasonably benign side effect profile. It's typically well tolerated, and we're always concerned about side effects particularly when it comes to polytherapy. The more drugs we prescribe, the more likely it is we'll have side effects. So this is quite a clean drug to add in. And in particular, the side effects of weight gain and sexual dysfunction. We know that bupropion has very mild effects in these domains, and these can be very problematic for people. And not only does it have a very few effects, it actually tends to cause weight loss, and it tends to have no effect at all on sexual dysfunction. Now, from a more practical point of view, how do we adapt to the possibility of insomnia and even in some cases, uh, agitation with bupropion? I think it's a really important point. And it, of course, it reminds us too that sleep and sedation with medication are double-edged swords. So they can be helpful or unhelpful depending on the patient in front of us. So the classic counterexample to that would be mirtazapine, for, for example, where if we think about how it can help people sleep, that can be very good for some patients. 
And it can be one of the reasons we might prescribe mirtazapine is aiming for an additional sedative effect. However, we will equally have some patients for whom that's intolerable, as well as the difficulties mirtazapine can cause with weight gain. So I think it's it's always the challenge. This is, again, about the, the person in front of us. And I, I think we can find this with SSRIs. I think we can also find that some people find SSRIs a little bit too activating, and it can make them quite agitated. So I think that is true about bupropion. Whether or not it's a good or a bad thing, I don't think is a. I don't think there's a single answer to that. I think it depends on the person in front of us, and it depends on the problems they have. And what's what's interesting in psychopharmacology more generally, I think, is is a move towards the the question: not is this drug good or bad, but the question of when does it work and in whom. And this concept of pharmacogenomics, of course, it's, we're at a very early stage and there's so much we don't know. But I think if we think about bupropion side effect profile, I think that activation is something we recognize. And there, there are data to support bupropion helping with what we might call melancholic depression, where people are quite anhedonic, where there's a lack of mood reactivity, and where we really want to push for that reactivity. So that can be where it can be helpful. But having said that, I think your point is quite right, that there can be other people for whom that can push an, an agitation and that the medication may not work. So it, it's a question about knowing our patients and, and, and trying to anticipate this. A further challenge is, of course, it do doesn't always work as we might hope it would. And people can be quite variable in the response. Continuing with adverse effects, uh, did you find evidence supporting the practice of adding bupropion to patients who already have uh, antidepressant-induced sexual uh, dysfunction? Yes, there, 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 there is evidence to support its use. I, I think sexual dysfunction and antidepressants is an important area. And I think in general practice, it's probably something that's under-recognized. And I think there are good reasons for that. I think patients can be less keen to talk about something that's quite personal to them. I think in terms of depression, there are lots of other complex factors involved in a depressive disorder that can lead to sexual dysfunction. So there can be loss of libido, loss of self-esteem and so forth. It's quite a complex process. And I think as clinicians, we can be hesitant to raise this as, as an issue. But I, th I think it is an important side effect. And one, uh, one of the problems with sexual dysfunction, of course, is sometimes during the acute phase of depression, it's the last thing on anyone's mind. But as people recover, this can become more of an issue. So, so a side effect that one might tolerate during the depths of a dark depression might not be side effect that we will tolerate as weeks turn into months and as depression turns into recovery. So I think there is good evidence, first of all, that we should be asking more about sexual dysfunction and there are ways to do this uh, sensitively with our patients. But if we think it's a problem, I think there is good evidence to support bupropion. So I, I think in terms of side effects, two very clear messages come out from bupropion. One is it won't cause sexual dysfunction. And there's some more limited data to suggest it may reverse existing sexual dysfunction in other patients in, in patients on other drugs. And secondly, then where weight gain is a problem, which is often the case with, with some of our drugs, it, it shouldn't cause weight gain. And it's more likely, in fact, to cause weight loss. Going back to our early, earlier discussion about activity and medication, of course, weight loss can be problematic for some and we were all aware that our patients who are depressed may not be easing, easing very well. So it can be a balance at times. Something interesting about your review is that you discuss the effects of bupropion across specific symptom uh, dimensions. You describe symptom domains for which it may be more effective and others for which it may be less effective. Uh, could you summarize this for us? I think the big thing for me is reminding ourselves as clinicians, so I, again, I, I use the word the depressions, but that we, we we can't treat individuals based on population size effects. So population size effects are, to me, the curse of pharmacological research, where we get this 
median figure on how effective a drug is. People don't respond in medians. So the, the big thing that keeps coming back to me is individuals are quite variable. And I think down the line, it's the, the differentials between symptom domains. So I think for clinicians to be mindful of that, that don't we, we never look at our patients as, as, as part of a population. We see the person in front of us. But to think, think not just of the diagnosis, but to think of the symptoms that are perhaps driving it. With regards to bupropion, the mentions that it seems to be most effective, and again, I, to, to add the caveat, there are limited data on this at the moment, but the data that are there suggest melancholic depression is an area to target. So that, again, we've said the anhedonia, the lack of mood reactivity, that that may be particularly well targeted by bupropion. And there were a couple of dimensions in which it seems less effective. So one of the areas it seems less effective is what we call negative affectivity and that's a presentation where there's a lot of guilt irritability fear or anxiety and neurobiologically it would seem that negative affectivity syndrome is more serotonergic in nature there was a very interesting paper that we reviewed within the uh, mess analysis which we thought was worthy of mention it was a study by uh, weissman where they they had uh, women who were depressed but what was very interesting about their study they looked at the improvement in the women's mental state but also that of their children and some of the women were bupropion some on escitalopram overall the women showed equal improvement on bupropion and on escitalopram so the drugs look equally effective but when they drilled down a bit and when they looked at the types of symptoms that responded and when they looked at the children's responses bupropion was not as good and what it seemed to be happening in that study was the escitalopram was better at targeting that negative affectivity that serotonergic syndrome whereas bupropion wasn't so good which of course pharmacologically we'd expect because it's not a serotonergic targeting drug the women in the studies said they were the women on escitalopram said they were better able to listen and the children described their mothers as more receptive that, that that's on escitalopram so bupropion may not be as effective for that group another quite interesting and for me somewhat counterintuitive uh, finding was bupropion seemed less effective in treating suicidal feelings compared to SSRIs. Now that, that I, I personally find that surprising and I can't explain it in that to me I classically think of serotonergic drugs having the risk of increasing suicidal thinking and we're, we're all mindful particularly with the younger patients how SSRIs can do that. So one might have predicted that a non-serotonergic drug might avoid that but certainly the, the limited evidence on the the main differentials between these drugs shows that bupropion is not so good with acute suicidal feelings. From your personal practice, can you think of situations in which bupropion is a good therapeutic option? I think from my personal practice, I think the melancholic depression is, is the one I look at. And, and this is where I suspect it, it, there's a combination of noradrenergic and dopaminergic uh, symptoms. So where I think there's really that negative affectivity. And I, I think that's a drug, that's where a time where I think bupropion may be the drug to shift that. And, and the other time I, I think of it is if I see someone who's come in with a real clear history of not being a non-responder to serotonergic drugs, it's, it's not uncommon that primary care might have tried three, four SSRIs and so forth. And someone's coming in and there's just no evidence of any shift on them. I, I might be minded to try something pharmacologically different of course we we have other options too we have snris and tricyclics and so forth but bupropion would be in my mind that way i think also a partial responder where i don't want to stop the first drug for various reasons but i want to add something in now, now this is the art of clinical practice so i wouldn't choose to guide all your listeners on when exactly that should happen but i think we all recognize there are many patients we're going to stop a drug to try something new but we do get a group of patients where we think there's been a partial response we want to keep that 
even if we don't think they're going to, to get much more of a response on that drug, but we want to do something extra. And bupropion is a drug that comes to mind for me at that point. I personally find it cleaner if that's a reasonable thing to say. There are many other drugs I, I like augmenting with. I'm Personally, I, I uh, augment with atypical antipsychotics quite a bit, but they have such a problematic issue around weight gain and this can be and sedation as well and this can be a real reason people won't take them even if they're effective and i that this is where i think bupropion is quite a clean second drug to add in so where i've got a bit of a response that i want to keep but i want to add something else and the other time is if someone comes in and, and it's clear to me either from the history or from our discussions that weight gain or sexual dysfunction are likely to be issues here or have been issues in the past. It's a drug that will come fairly quickly to mind in those cases. This was Dr. Derek Tracy discussing his paper, Bupropion, a systematic review and meta-analysis of effectiveness as an antidepressant. If you want to learn more about this drug, you can type the psychopharmacology of bupropion in Google to watch our illustrated video tutorial. Also, remember that premium members can download this episode. To learn more about premium membership, you can click the link below this interview. Thank you for listening.